Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, edition of Innovations in Surgery Conference. Uh, today, we're going to have a very exciting program coming to you from two different sites, from uh, McGill University, Dr. Melina Vassilou, and also from the University of Leeds in the UK, Dr. Danilo Miskovic. Uh, the topic is a very interesting one and one that's evolving uh, rapidly. That is, uh, current and future technologies used to assess surgical skills, something that is germane to all of us, regardless of our specialty, colorectal, bariatric, uh, solid organ, endocrine, whatever we do. Morning. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I have a confession that I did change around the um, title a little bit. Uh, and instead of current and future technologies, um, I decided more to talk about some of my ideas, less based on data and more based on just some thoughts that I had and reflecting on actually uh, the recent publication that came out in the Annals of Surgery. Um, the, it's a study actually survey performed by the Fellowship Council <clears throat> looking at uh, how well general surgery residents uh, are prepared for fellowship and they did uh, they surveyed the program directors of these fellowship programs um, to uh, ask them questions about you know uh, all sorts of different things including you know professionalism surgical skills uh, psychomotor abilities uh, etc and the things that came out of this really were that a lot of them, 38% demonstrated a lack of patient ownership, 30% could not independently perform a lab coli, and 66% were deemed unable to operate for 30 minutes unsupervised. Interestingly, 56% of them could not suture laparoscopically, and this is in the era of all of them assuming that the majority of them would have been FLS certified. And so I know that we love to interact in these discussions, and I thought this would be one opportunity before I uh, give some of my opinions on this. Uh, what, I, what, I wonder if we could open it up to, uh, uh, to have a little bit of a discussion as to first, I, I'd be curious as to what people think of this and why they think um, this, uh, the, these results are as they are. And one other point that I wanted to make beforehand is that one other thing that came out in the qualitative component that they had of the study was that the fellows seemed to be unable to conceive, design, and conduct research. They had very little interest in academic, uh, in academic work. Thanks, Melina. And that, that's a good point. Um, I, I was one of the co-authors on the study, so I, uh, was, I must say I was quite surprised at some of the results we're seeing. Let me um, perhaps see if uh, our friend Professor Howard Darcy is, is in at Imperial College. And, ask a little bit about some of the training programs in the UK. Um, if we could go to Imperial. Um, is Ara there by any chance? Hi there. Um, I'm afraid uh, Professor Darcy's not here today. Um, however, there's a couple of us here. I think all, all of us here are surgical residents. So uh, perhaps uh, we could uh, tell you a little bit about what we do. Okay, so I'm not going to train you how to, I'm not going to ask you how to train yourselves. So I think I'll give you a pass on that one. Um, I'd love to hear what the surgical residents have to say. <laughs> oh, about how they should be trained or what their training is? Well, what their thoughts on of why the study turned out the way that it is, why their program directors perceive them in this light. Well, I don't know that theirs did. They're in the UK. But nonetheless, we can ask. We only surveyed U.S. programs and Canadian programs. But yeah. in any event, go ahead, guys. Have a pass at it. How, do, how does uh, Prof. Darcy teach you to, uh, to suture, and how does uh, he, how do he and his colleagues teach you to operate in general? Sure, um, thanks. Um, we, we were quite surprised by those results ourselves, actually. Um, I think the training program here is, is quite different in the sense that uh, it's certainly longer, it's double the length. Um, it takes you at least 10 years to reach attending status. Um, also, uh, we tend to do um, more independent operating, uh, particularly on the emergency surgery side. So uh, the smaller cases, for instance, um, abscesses, uh, endosectomies, uh, will often be done independently uh, once you've reached a certain level of competency, which has been agreed with your consultant. Um, so I think uh, it's probably difficult to compare directly. Um, I don't know whether the numbers of people going into fellowships are greater, uh, or proportion rather is greater in the States uh, compared to here. That's, that's not data that I have uh, access to at the moment. 
So a combination, uh, I mean, uh, you do have the skill center, the mattress units, and, and things at the Royal College. Uh, is that part of the standard curriculum? I mean, you're, you're right in London. You can go down the street to the simulation center. Is that a big part of it? Sure. Um, in, in London, it's actually um, quite easy to access the skill centers. And uh, I myself actually am a, a trainee from Birmingham who's, who's doing research down here. Uh, and I have to say that the skills uh, centres aren't as common outside of um, uh, London. Um, you, you do have access to them when you pay for courses um, or if there's uh, special training courses, but they're not always mandatory. Uh, so the skills uh, access to skills centres is, is certainly not mandatory, um, but it is something that is increasing and it is becoming more uh, dispersed now. Too. Okay, thanks. Let me, let me ask somebody in the U.S. who maybe wasn't involved in the, in the study, uh, if Barry Salke, uh possibly is at Mount Sinai in New York, um, if we can turn over to Sinai. Um, anybody want to take this on? Any of the attendings there? Okay, maybe Melina, we're finding out why the we're finding out in a hurry why the yeah. training isn't quite what this we think is, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> what what why don't you go on? Because I don't want to keep yeah. calling on rooms without faculty present. So why don't why don't you uh, go on and tell us some more of why we're getting the answer we're getting? I, I mean, I don't know, and there are a lot of hypotheses as to why uh, uh, this is happening. But interestingly, for the most part, it's things that are, you know, demonstrating lack of patient ownership, um, and that the, that they had lack of autonomy. Um, and and I started to think about this from a personal perspective also, and thought, you know, um, fellowship is really a time where you kind of hone all of those. Uh, kind of, it's kind of like finishing school and the fact that 80% or even more now of graduating residents are doing fellowships um, leads something, like, you know, is, is something for us to, to kind of think about. So I won't comment too much more uh, on this study, but I think that there are a lot of different reasons why this might be. Um, and so uh, I, leading into that, I want to talk a little bit about this um, shift that we are making now towards competency-based education and some of the skills uh, for surgeons that are changing now in this modern era, in particular the need to adapt to uh, having creative and innovative ways of, of solving problems, um, uh, issues of motivation and making meaning, and how these might somehow have something to do with the fact that, patient, that residents and surgeons are not taking ownership over patients, and how to kind of find that balance moving forward in designing training programs in the future. <clears throat> So there's no question that we are in a different era and that the world of surgery, the professional environment, the way we do take care of patients is changing rapidly, not only in the sense that we're getting a whole bunch of different technologies that are changing at rates that we cannot keep up with. So there's no way that anybody in any training program is going to learn all of the skills and knowledge that they need to treat patients well into the future, into their career. So we have to find a way to teach them that adaptability, but also expectations of patients are changing and um, we have uh, less and less resources and there's a much more global collaborative world and a lot more awareness now of the need for people to find meaning and purpose in the work that they're doing. <clears throat> so it's not good enough to be competent anymore. I don't think that we're just aiming for competence really. That's just the entry into the game now. We have to be great. Um, and so in order to do that, we need to find fulfillment, meaning, and a real willingness to contribute uh, from an intrinsically motivating place. So you want to be a surgeon. The skills of the 21st century of critical thinking, being able to solve problems, collaborate across networks, um, being agile, adaptable, entrepreneurial, being able to communicate, all of these are sort of entry into the playing field. And I guess the question is, are we training people to have these skills? Are we training surgeons to be able to think creatively, to um, solve problems in the real world? So are we, are we training surgeons to be creative, to adapt, and to be able to move forward in their careers when they're finished their training programs and then they're moved on into their careers, um, et cetera? Um, again, we're also dealing now with a new generation, and there we will be future generations that are different as well, but the millennials or the generations coming through now definitely are more collaborative. 
They see things differently, uh, accomplish goals in different ways. They're very dependent on technology. And, um, and, and so these are all things that I think need to be taken to an account when we're designing our, our training programs. And I think this concept of really being able to uh, allow people to exercise their own autonomy when they're doing something that's complex like becoming a surgeon isn't the same thing as this industrial type of, of behavioralism where um, you know, we can just tell people what to do and if they do everything we tell them to do that they will get the result that they're looking for. In fact, it's much more complex than that. And if we break everything down into all of its parts and say if you achieve competency in all of these things, you will be an excellent surgeon, I think we're fooling ourselves to think that the sum of all of those parts will end up as the whole that we're looking for. And so I have a little video here which I wanted to introduce before, <clears throat> um, which comes actually from, it's a, it's a clip of a video which really uh, is, is um, about child education, but I think the concepts actually are very interesting and as applicable to how we teach surgeons or how we teach anyone, for example. And it's a clip from uh, um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Ken, Sir Ken Robinson, who is a very um, vocal and prominent educator and consultant for re education reform. Um, and uh, and uh, the clip here that I want to show you is really about kind of the the, the the balance between standardization and testing and, and creating structure in a teaching program versus having a program which is individualized and uh, allows people to kind of really be um, uh, uh, aware, aware of you'll illustrate it so it's it's a clip it's a clip of a video so uh, I, don't, I kind of want to situate in it you in it he, he just finished talking about how kids nowadays, there's this epidemic of ADHD and they're all being given Ritalin because they can't sit down and study and focus so that they can pass all of their standardized tests. So he's moving on from that idea. The clip is a couple of minutes long, actually. Amazing, but the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children to education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, uh, ringing bells, separate facilities. Uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. I mean, well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. So I thought this would be a good opportunity actually to um, maybe just see what people think about this radical idea and I, under, I the whole point was also to uh, kind of ruffle things up a little bit but I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about how, um, <clears throat> uh, about the idea of perhaps moving away from standardization and, and breaking everything down into competencies and more towards an individualized way of, of teaching our residents. Uh, how to become surgeons. Yeah, I, you may be ahead of us in Canada with some of the uh, systems Richard Resnick and others have looked at with individualized progression, uh, but, but let's uh, see how things are going in the U.S. in this regard. Maybe we can go to Johns Hopkins, and I hope that somebody's there who can take on the issue of, of resident education in a standardized versus nice non-standardized manner okay we're going to keep going around it may this may be a very intimate conversation um, I, I don't think it necessarily is. only needs to be faculty i'd love to hear uh, what thoughts residents have on this as well because it obviously involves them 
Well, if there are any there, they're high. Or fellows. Maybe they're, maybe they're out being educated. How about uh, Ohio State University? We take a stab at uh, Scott Melvin's program. Okay. Guys, we'd welcome your thoughts on uh, what's been said so far, in particular attention to any standardization of training in your program there versus uh, individual progression as one meets certain uh, predefined thresholds. But please move the mic closer because we can't hear you. I would say we mostly have a fairly traditional standardized program. We've started to move one of the chief rotations sort of to having them pick what they want to do, sort of slight introduction to early specialization to try to help them get out of it, that last year what they what they want to get out of it. And I think that's, overall, I think that's the direction we'll, everyone will end up going is to try to get people trained adequately to do exactly what they want to do rather than trying to suboptimally train a whole bunch of people to do a bunch of stuff they're never really going to do. Yeah, I think that's uh, certainly something the American Board of Surgery has discussed as well. Um, Melina may be referring slightly to being checked off on an individual, and you can chime in, Melina, but I, I, the discussion I've heard in Canada is that somebody has to do a procedure or various steps of a procedure, whether it's within the basic training or the advanced training, before moving on to other procedures. So it's not necessarily moving between programs from, let's say, general surgery to plastic surgery, but rather from an, uh, a gallbladder to a spleen, something like that. Is that what you're driving at? So, <clears throat> no, in fact, like, this is not what we're doing, and I'm not speaking to this from the point of view, like, this is what we're doing in Canada, and this is working really well for us. I think I, I, I'm, I'm sort of asking us to imagine even a step further like, why do we have to actually train people to become general surgeons? Like, maybe we're going to train someone who is specialized in doing, you know, um, a, a disease-based thing or someone who has various different expertises which span across specialties in radiology, in pathology. Someone takes out their own specimen. They look at it under the slide. They give someone chemo. A different model that may be different for various people for various strengths that they have. Um, and that it's a much more personalized approach. Again, I'm not saying we're anywhere near there. I'm just asking people to imagine how that would be. Um, because I think in the act or in, in the attempts to standardize, check off, uh, make sure people achieve everything that we think that they're achieving, I think we're in deconstructing things, we're losing something in there. Um, and, and this is more just a thought-provoking discussion that I wanted to have and not so much to say that this is what we're doing and you should really try it. But, but I know it is being done selectively because Richard has spoken about it and, and there are certain, and I think orthopedics may have been the specialty of memory search, correct, where they're doing it. Yes, yes, yeah. We do have some pilot projects and you're right, orthopedic surgery is one where that whereby they are moving towards a competency base. So instead of saying you, you, you do things or you finish after a certain year, you achieve competency and if it, if it takes you five years or four years or three years, however long it takes you, um, it's more like achieving those, those competencies. But again, I'm not sure that that's any, it's certainly a different model and an interesting model, but um, and, and a more personalized model. Yes, it's moving. It's moving certainly in that direction. So. Um, so why don't we get you to finish the rest seven. of your yeah. talk? Yeah. yeah. Let's get you to run through the rest of yours so we can turn over to Danilo and maybe some other people will filter in for discussion during his. Yeah. Maybe you could just finish yours. Um, it, I, I actually think that I'm. I'm. I'd be happy to kind of finish it here. I was going to talk a little bit more about sort of how when we, when we do that or when we want to move away from, um, uh, from uh, measuring things that are easy to measure and breaking things down into things that we can make assessments for and that, that, that we can kind of uh, assess people on, we lose something in that because the assessments of things that are much more complex um, uh, are, are difficult to measure, but that in some sense, I don't think that that should mean that we shouldn't measure them. So, and that it's better perhaps to measure things um, that are more important rather than, uh, and less accurately rather than to measure unimportant things, but with great accuracy. And that um, I, I think that our assessments in surgery and education moving forward 
are, um, uh, should uh, be much more uh, authentic, embedded, uh, perhaps less quote-unquote valid or rigorous or high stakes, but perhaps more useful and organic uh, 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 as we individualize it to the various different people uh, moving forward. So, um, you know, in fact, I think I'll leave it there. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, uh, hand it over to uh, Danilo, who, uh, who has a, a slightly different view, or not, not a, who will talk a, a little bit about different, more, much more data-based uh, uh, <laughs> than I had in my talk. But I think we share a lot of, a, a lot of the similar, uh, similar views. So thank you for the okay. opportunity uh, to, uh, to present. Thanks, Melina. Um, there is one question from Carolina's Medical Center. If we could um, go to Carolina's Medical Center before we go over to Leeds in the UK. Uh, this is Dr. Stefanidis, Dimitri Stefanidis, uh, and I want to thank Melina. Can you hear us? Yeah. I want to thank Melina yeah. uh, for uh, bringing the topic up. <clears throat> and um, I think that to answer some of the questions you posed, Melina, there's, there's obviously not a, a perfect answer. Um, I do think that what you showed in your video is important. The problem in surgery is that there's also a patient involved. And uh, we cannot forget that and only focus on the educational part, even though ideally, yes, it would be done that way maybe. Um, so we do have a responsibility to the patient, and that's where the standardization comes in. Um, I think it's two different processes. One is the assessment, and one is the training. And maybe the assessment does need to be robust to make sure we don't create problems as we're learning to, for our patients. But at the same time, it needs to be individualized so that we can get better. The reality is, as you know, that if um, the way we, we learn and teach in surgery, where we have somebody standing next to us and all the time talk to us, is not really the best way to learn because you develop dependency on the feedback you get, and then it's very hard to, to do something individually. Well, I'm not sure. I personally have not figured out how better to do this, maybe outside of the open room, right? Uh, outside of the open room, it, it may be doable, but inside the open room, uh, it's really hard to not intervene if you think you, uh, your patient is at risk. So clearly, the good thing about all this is that we have started a discussion, and now we're looking at this uh, from many different angles, but the solution is not going to be that easy. Good, good salient uh, comments. I appreciate that. Um, if we have one other question or comment from Medical College of Wisconsin, if we could uh, turn over to the Medical College of Wisconsin, please. Morning. Good morning. I don't know if you Hi, can Lauren. see us or not. We can see you in the shadows, Lauren, but we can hear you well. OK. Well, I wanted to thank Melina for um, challenging our thinking about some things that sort of the underpinnings level. And three words that, that stood out in that discussion were these concepts of collaboration, hierarchy, and accountability. and how we're going to get to more collaborative models when we work within a system where fundamentally what, how most of us perceive our relationships with our patients as attending is from a standpoint of being um, completely accountable and, and th that functions through a hierarchical model. So I think it's going to be difficult to try to reach to changing how we think about things educationally unless we can also reflect on how we function as, uh, in our roles. I do think this idea about individualizing training may address the accountability piece in a different way than we've thought about because if each trainee has a set of tasks or goals that they're individually accountable for and are um, being measured by somehow, then um, maybe we'll get to that piece of individual ownership that some of us recognize differently. Thanks. I think that's going to tie in uh, well to Danilo's talk, Lauren. Um, if we can turn over to Leeds in the UK, and um, you're right, Melina, uh, Danilo's talk is going to be significantly different in terms of some of the data. Um, good morning, Danilo, or perhaps good afternoon for you. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, why don't you proceed with your talk? Thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Perfectly well. Hear you and see you. 
Well, uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's, it's a great pleasure. It's, it's still morning here, or we would count it as morning. It's before 12 and it's raining. Um, I, as, you, as you already mentioned, I, I would like to take this away a little bit from uh, that kind of basic trainee level uh, to uh, maybe a bit more talking about assessment and especially talking about assessment of specialist surgeons or of what we would uh, probably look at as, as experts. So how should we um, measure performance in the future uh, when we look at expert performance? And I would like to, um, can you see my slides as well? Sorry. Can, we can see the slides quite well, thanks. Okay. Uh, well, I, I would like to start here, and this made big news, uh, at least here in the UK. I don't know whether it made big news as well beyond the borders of the United Kingdom, but. Um, early this year, there was a publication of a, um, a report which was looking into uh, the shortfalls of one particular hospital uh, in the middle of England. And basically what it revealed is that uh, this hospital failed on several levels, uh, managerial levels, clinical services, nursing services, and basically uh, led to actually unnecessary deaths um, of patients. and. This obviously made big headlines here and uh, caused a lot of public uproar as well. Um, and that was kind of the political backdrop um, where the government uh, here instructed uh, different medical specialty bodies to come up with solutions to make uh, performance, clinical performance more transparent. And to cut the long sh uh, story short, it basically led um, for colorectal surgery, I'm taking this as an example because I'm a colorectal surgeon myself, um, to the result that the Royal College of Surgeons uh, suggested that colorectal surgeons su should publish their individual 90-day mortality rates for colorectal resections. Now, talking about mortality um, is always raising some question marks, and I would just like to discuss this a little bit now, because I think this is what we are facing, I think, not only here in this country, but um, also in other parts of the world. So one first thing that we have to discuss here is, uh, and I have shown this picture many times before, is, um, is an ethical dimension. Um, this is a painting of the Battle of Waterloo. It's actually after the Battle of Waterloo, and when you look at the details of the painting, you would see that people are going through the battlefield looking for survivors and counting the death. And um, that's a bit what we're doing. So we're kind of going back and look at all the havoc that we created uh, and we can't do much about it anymore, rather than just uh, counting the bodies, really. So um, there are a few ethical issues coming up here, which are, which are really uh, dangerous, I think, in certain ways. And I'm sure you can think about um, other problems here as well. But leaving all these ethical issues aside, let's look at the real example as a worked example. So these are, these are, these are real data uh, from an unnamed hospital here in the UK. In this hospital, there are four senior uh, colorectal surgeons. And these are the kind of figures that would be published uh, for their 90-day mortality. And 90-day mortality really means that uh, patients who had uh, an, uh, a major colorectal resections uh, it doesn't matter what they died of, whether this was related to the operation or whether they were run over by a bus or choked on a kebab, so they all would be counted as death to this particular surgeon. And these are the figures of these four surgeons, and uh, the figures would actually be risk-adjusted. The risk adjustment is, uh, uh, involves um, ASA status and some of the cancer data, but it's very rudimentary. And you can see surgeon A has 0% mortality and surgeon D has 7.3% mortality. I don't know about you, but if I was a if I was a patient looking at this, I would uh, probably go for surgeon A because I'm not particularly keen to die when I go for an operation, uh, and that's how I would make up my mind. If you look just a little bit more into the details, and we just look at how many procedures have they done over the last two years, then you would see that the surgeon A has done 16 resections, whereas surgeon D has done 87, and. Now, I know these surgeons, and uh, so I, I know what the background is. And uh, the background here really is that surgeon A uh, is actually a newly appointed surgeon who has a very selective uh, practice, and surgeon D is a very senior surgeon with a specialist interest in advanced and recurrent cancer. So it's going to be very difficult to compare them directly. But even leaving that aside, um, just looking at the numbers, I think this uh, was a very interesting paper which just came out in The Lancet um, a month ago. 
And what they were doing is calculating how many cases do you actually need, need in a certain specialty to uh, reach enough power that this data can determine whether someone is an outlier or not. And you can see here for bowel cancer resections, this number goes to 179 procedures to reach 80% power. And mind, 80% power means that if you find 10 outliers, two of the 10 would still be falsely accused of being an outlier. So 179 procedures. How long would that take our surgeons to uh, get there to, to have a fair assessment? And you can see for surgeon A, this would be 22 years of practice. So this is very problematic, I think, to look at surgical performance in that way. Um, the, the, the Royal College also suggested other uh, perform performance parameters or outcome parameters, such as length of stay, uh, readmission rates, complications, etc. But whatever you do or whatever you're looking at, when you look at adverse outcomes, you always have the same problem, which is that you have a lot of factors, um, obviously, uh, causing outcome. And it is, it, it is almost impossible, I think, to adjust uh, just to see whether the operative skill or the surgical skills of a particular person are responsible for uh, the given outcome. So I think the only thing that you can really say is that if you have good outcome, then you can probably say that your system is working. Whereas if you have bad outcomes, uh, the only thing you can assume is that maybe one or several components of your systems are failing. I don't know whether we want to talk about this here or uh, if you want to take it to the next step here. Well, I think um, I'd open up for any questions. The only one I have so far really relates back to Molina, so I probably will defer on that one. Somebody emailed a question, but I'm going to wait on that one. Um, and I think that w there is sufficient uh, familiarity with this type of system you've described, you know, the problems with the NHS earlier this year, and I, I did see a lot of that when I was over there earlier this year. Um, but we've had the uh, Society for Thoracic Surgeons publishing their databases, and uh, typically in New York City, the cardiac surgeons, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, the mortality is, is published in the New York Times every year. Um, and this, uh, again, as you've shown, can be misconstrued because you have somebody taking on very high-risk patients, looks like they have a high mor mortality, somebody cherry-picking easy cases, uh, doing quite well. Um, and I'm just curious if we um, go to uh, somebody else here in, in the U.S. and maybe, uh, maybe Phil Schauer in, uh, in Ohio can comment a little bit about you know, surgeon scorecards and uh, public reporting of, uh, of data. If we go to main, no, main campus in Cleveland, Ohio, please. Uh, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, not Ohio State. Um, and yes. see, uh, Phil, can you comment a little? Because the, the bariatric surgeons certainly uh, are, again, following very close in the heels of uh, Society for Thoracic Surgeons and ASMBS, uh, SRC, and others with reporting. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how it plays out here in this country. Sure, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, per perfectly great, well, great. Phil. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's quite remarkable. Danilo's um, example, you saw those four surgeons and you saw the differential mortality rates, and yet, you know, the risk uh, adjustment is supposed to correct uh, for that. It's supposed to correct for the higher risk patient that the surgeon who had the higher mortality rate and then level the playing field. but. It seems to me that's one of the big uh, problems these days is these risk adjustment systems are not accurate and don't uh, level the playing field. And, and uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this is, as you mentioned, Steve, has affected bariatric surgery in quite a big uh, way just uh, six or seven years ago when we were in our exponential growth phase uh, of this field growing at rates of 25 to 30 percent uh, national volume per year, we were hearing, uh, you know, in the newspapers, uh, very high mortality rates. And so the organization, the ASMBS, responded by creating these centers of excellence to try, uh, as Danilo pointed out, to put, help surgeons put the systems together, and not just the surgeon skill, but the multidisciplinary support that is required. Uh, and so far, um, you know, these things are hard to measure, but it looks like it's had a big impact. Um, at least we're seeing less front page news about 
bariatric patients, you know, dying. On the other hand, it's quite remarkable um, that CMS right now is uh, is really uh, considering pulling back uh, based on this notion that um, you know volume itself is not a very good um, marker of outcomes. CNS is considering pulling back and completely dismantling the Center of Excellence program. So I think this speaks to this notion that um, uh, I think we're all really struggling on uh, how you know how to measure quality. Um, but I think what's clear is, as Danilo pointed out, that simple mortality rates or picking out one particular outcome measure is clearly insufficient. Thanks, Bill. Um, great points. If we can go back to um, Danilo for the presentation. Yeah, so the leads of UK. The, the question. I'm all back. You are now back. Okay. Um, so the question is really what, what should we do instead? And uh, I would like you to, to look at this guy here. He's. he's uh, practicing something that is called Kyudo, which is um, a very traditional Japanese martial art, uh, which is basically firing an arrow at a target. The interesting thing is actually that these guys are not thinking about the target. What they are trying to do is to get every move absolutely right. And the philosophy behind this, if they do everything absolutely correct in a correct way, then the arrow must hit the target without even thinking about it. Now, what these guys are doing really is is looking at the process rather than at the outcome, and and this is I think um, what we should uh, focus on a bit more. Um, I've drawn this pyramid here because educationalists usually love the shape of pyramids, and I put outcomes at the bottom, meaning that outcomes are not very good um, as we as we pointed out before um, to describe someone's uh, personal performance or personal skills. I put processes at the top because I think processes are much more individual and can actually look into someone's individual uh, performance. The problem is that outcomes are very easy to assess, so it's easy to, to just collect data and, and put it in some database, whereas processes are much more difficult and much more complex to, to look at. I put something in between which I would call outcome surrogates and I would just quickly look at that, what I mean with that. And uh, I just demonstrate this with, with one simple example um, and I have to show this because I'm, I'm broadcasting here from, from Leeds and uh, my pathology colleagues here, Nick West and, and Phil Quirk, they have done this fantastic work on specimen quality in colorectal cancer. So they, they could basically show that the, the quality of the, of the surgical specimen, the completeness of, completeness of the surgical specimen directly correlates with the survival probability of the patients. So um, that's a kind of a, an outcome surrogate. So not every patient with a bad specimen dies, but um, it is a surrogate for kind of the surgical quality and it's much closer to the surgeon than uh, a crude outcome such as mortality. And again, it's quite easy to, um, to uh, assess. But uh, let me just talk for the last two or three minutes about processes. And I, uh, I'm aware of the time, so I don't want to go into too many details. But um, when we're looking at processes, I think that the important thing is to, to get the, the, the process assessment right. Um, so um, I, I take as an example again here, so just operative skills of surgeons are operating um, as, as one of these processes that we, that, that we can look at. And I think the, the beginning is very important. We have to get the start right. Um, Melina, there's a question here um, which is uh, from uh, Dr. Ivan George. Um, do we have sufficient deconstruction of our domain to be able to have the flexibility to train in a novel fashion. <laughs> Thanks, Ivan. Um, so, you know, I don't know that we know the answer to that. I don't know that we know um, that we have to deconstruct things to understand them because, you know, as human beings, I think we have a, 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 the, the capacity to understand complexity. And maybe the way to measure it and the way to teach it isn't by deconstructing it. Maybe there's another way to do it. So I, I acknowledge your question in the sense that we have to understand things in order to then be able to adapt them, right? So we have to have a good base in order to be able to kind of 
be, be flexible on top of that. But I, I don't know what the, the limits of that are, and I don't know what is enough. But I, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, maybe go somewhere we haven't yet and see if we can get any other comments. For example, uh, Lankanaw. We haven't tuned into Lankanaw Mainline today in uh, the Mark's Colorectal Foundation. Um, Jerry, you've been uh, an active uh, participant in, in training for many years. Um, and I uh, was wondering any, any thoughts you might share with us on how things have evolved and, and where we need to go. I'm sorry that uh, John's not here yet. Um, this is a very provocative uh, presentation. Uh, I love it, but an hour is not sufficient to uh, address these issues. Um, um, I think on the one hand, the, the attitude that um, uh, creativity is more important than fundamental standardization uh, scares me a little bit. I think we all need a firm foundation in surgical concepts before we start um, uh, injecting our own uh, creativity. And then on the other hand, the, the other part of the presentation uh, is uh, very interesting. Um, it's extremely important for people to understand the degree of difficulty and stage of disease is very important in determining uh, the comparative outcomes. This was first promoted by Dr. Dean Joseph Ganella uh, way back uh, in the uh, 70s. And um, it's something that uh, must be injected in the, into the um, interpretation of uh, data as it's presented to us. But basically, the, the gist of what I was trying to say um, is that we, we probably need to somehow move away from, from purely outcome-based uh, performance analysis, and we have to move towards more process-based analysis. That's literally what I wanted to say at the end, but uh, I'm sorry that you couldn't get all the rest of my talk. Well, thanks. Has the paper been published yet, or is it just the EPUB ahead of uh, print? Uh, no, it is uh, in the submission process. So, okay, because I couldn't tell by the slide. It looked like it might have snuck out an EPUB, so it, it's still in the uh, peer review process. That's right. Okay, well, everyone will catch up with it when it's hopefully accepted and, and read it in detail. You certainly put a lot of work into that study, corralling uh, folks from uh, really all six inhabited continents together to get opinions and, and expert uh, Delphi consensus. and. Uh, want to commend everybody to read Danilo's manuscript once it uh, is accepted and published. Again, thanks to you, Danilo. Thanks, Melina.